Good morning. Welcome to our Community Policing Podcast. Uh, today I have with me from our training cadre here in Bloomfield Township, Officer Ryan Smith and Lieutenant Mike Buchek. Officer Smith's been with our agency for... 20, 21, years. 21 years now. And Mike, you've been here obviously 20... 18. 18. 19. Close 19, enough. 19. Um, both Ryan and Mike have, bo- uh, have, have an extensive training history with our department. Uh, both of them were field training officers. Uh, both of them were evidence technicians. Uh, Ryan is still part of our training cadre, uh, and he's been part of our training cadre for several... 15 years. 15 almost. years in the reality-based active shooter response portion of it. Um, Mike as well. Uh, Mike is now in charge of, the, of this, this cadre. Um, let's say go back to, I believe it was August 30th. We uh, were asked late last year, maybe either, either beginning early this year or late last year by the school district if we'd be willing to participate in a mass casualty training incident uh, exercise at our high school. Um, I kind of threw that in your two lap, uh, spontaneous there, but it took a long time to prepare. Um, but we, I, I kind of want to talk real quick about why it's so important to be able to partner with our school district uh, in a situation like this um, and, and what benefits it could have for the officers and the teachers um, during something like this. Because as, as we know, these incidents are popping up all across the country. We've talked about them in past podcasts that they're in our own backyard now with, with uh, the, the what happened in Oxford and Michigan State University. Um, so I guess let's talk about why we do reality-based training and, and why it's so important to our agency. I think the main part is, and these are incidents that are uh, high stress, low frequency. We don't deal with them very often. They're the things that are the most stressful and the most dangerous situations that we deal with. And the more training that we can give our officers in a training setting is going to help them be more productive and more, you know, as safe as they can uh, if something like this does really happen. Right. And the exposure as well, correct? Absolutely. Especially in this situation, we talk about that we did this on a, a, a day for the a professional development uh, for the teachers. And that was kind of one of our goals when we talked to the school district of why it's so important for the teachers to be exposed at what, what our response looks like, um, but also kind of putting them into a situation or, that is not comfortable by any means, um, but they need to know and be exposed to how to react in the event something like this happened here. Um, we did have an incident, you know, the um, we had opt out clauses for the teachers, but overwhelmingly, I would think that we had some great participation from the teachers. Absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Why is it important for these teachers to be exposed um, to, to these scenarios? Well, it gives them a familiarity uh, to an incredibly stressful situation. So, you know, and it shows that if, if you've experienced something prior to experiencing it, it for the first time um, and under extreme stress, you're gonna perform better the second time. So we want them to see our response, understand, think about their possible response and have a plan and be prepared. And it just allows them to be more prepared if something like this were to happen. Right. Um- with that, the majority of our reality-based training, you guys develop off of real-life scenarios. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. why is that important? It's it's extremely important to have something that is based on a situation that can occur. Um, we, we do surveys every year after all of our training to see you know how real and relevant the training was and we're constantly working to to tweak that to make sure but we draw from real experiences so we can say that this scenario occurred you know in oxford or it occurred at michigan state that's why we're training on it to to so when officers say well this would never happen um it, it has happened and we want to train and be ready for those situations yeah this obviously i talked about this being you know the idea behind it late last school year or early this year, um, we I think you guys planned this for almost nine months uh, before it actually took yeah. place. Let's talk a little bit about how we do that. This isn't just something that we throw together overnight and, and it, it happens, right? And I know from firsthand, I, I kind of you know, trusted and, and you guys are the expert in it much more than I am when, you, when you're developing these scenarios. Um, and so you guys ran with it. And overall, we know it was a success. We, we know a lot of the things that, that took place that day. We, we, we found areas where we need to grow. Um, but overall, the response 
really was fantastic. But let's talk about how the planning that goes into this. What? Let's just talk about a couple of the steps into it. The meetings. I mean, how many meetings did we have? Yeah, I mean, we had at least what twelve to fifteen meetings, probably between all of our training cadres, including the schools, including um, the fire department, obviously, who was a big part of it as well. Um, outside agencies that we've had that we had assistance from, and uh, yeah, I mean, there was countless meetings. Mike and I worked obviously on our own together beyond that. I mean, on a weekly basis. So, um, you know, we, we've done these trainings enough just interdepartment wise that we we know how to run the, the entire training. But this was just such a such a mass scale. Um, it was just a quite a bit more of an undertaking than than just our department training. Right. And let's put let's put the scale to it about we'll, we'll estimate 800 teachers in the building. Approximately. Um, you know, give or take some. Um, about a hundred law enforcement agent or a hundred uh, first responders that responded to it um, between police and fire, and then the guests we invited to to observe or the controllers. Um, so we talk about the the training, but when we do these trainings, we're not just sending people in just off the wall. Each one of these, um, when we talk about resources needed, each team that went into that building, whether it was a rescue task force team or a contact team, had a controller with them. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, how did we select these controllers? Well, they came from our training cadre and other area departments, training cadres. Um, they have, you know, instructor level courses that they've gone through, so they know what to look for. They know how to handle the officers going through the situation and they're also trained in making sure the scenario is safe. That that was their biggest undertaking with all of this, with the amount of people in the building and the amount of officers and firefighters responding. We wanted to make sure everybody was going to be safe. It's a it's a weapons-free training zone, so we don't have any accidents, uh, and we're not willing to cut corners on that. And that was our biggest undertaking, and and it worked very well. It it did go very well, and it is a. Um Kudos to you guys because it did go that way, and we did from day one. Um, you guys have been to some other area agencies where they went well, but you learned some areas where you where the internal security for the people that are participating and the participants, 800 teachers that we're responsible for in that building, that they don't get hurt on an accidental whatever, whether it's a shooting. We've we've seen them across the country where unfortunately somebody's loaded firearm ended up into a training scenario. Um, so I think that's a you know, when you talk a success story, that's it's very important to point out here. Absolutely. Um, but we also have every officer's firearm was uh, made not to be able to, you know, was transitioned to not fire live rounds. We also have to do a security detail then, correct? Yes. J absolutely. Just to protect the officers and the people that are there from an outside threat, knowing we're doing it, knowing that we can't have fire, our firearms in there. So that's a whole nother aspect to plan in this, yeah. uh, is having like an overwatch. Yeah, and it's something that we don't always have the, the extent when we do our, our interdepartment training. Um, we don't need, to because it's not such a large scale. So with this one, yeah, we had quite a bit of exterior security. We had a quick response team that was prepared for anything. We had a fire station on, on standby for any sort of emergencies, anything like that. So yeah, it was, it was quite a bit. Yeah. Um, we, we kind of talked about the primary objective, and again, that's recreating that stress. Um, it's very hard to do that in just everyday training, you know, and to, to be able to recreate the stress for our fire department, for our police department. Um, and I've talked prior podcasts, and I, I think it's just always still important to hit home that the, the standard of what police and fire do now on these response to any, it doesn't, it, we, we say schools, but it could be any active incident, open air, whether it's, you know, something were to happen at one of our large open air events in the summer or um, at an office building or a store that the old days of the fire department waiting outside to find out that there, everything was clear and everybody's okay are gone. So we now have that rescue task force. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that when we talk about the moulaging of patients or we had, I think in this one, we had up to 20 patients mm -hmm. who were looked, dressed up, nursing students, as if they had those gunshot wounds or some type of injury. Re I mean, that's part of recreating that stress, Absolutely. correct? Um, which we just can't do on an every single day basis when we do our reality-based training. So let's talk, we're, we're going to walk through what, you know, what the expectations today are, are in response to um, an active shooter. So... Um, 
we're, we're going to watch a video and we'll walk through that video on what these expectations are. Um, and then we'll talk about the timeline of, of that training day. So here's a video. So as part of the training, let's walk through this. We had a, in order for our cable studio to be able to participate and get some video, we, we set up a um, secondary location here at the cable studio. So let's walk through this. Obviously, the, guy, the gentleman in the yellow, one of our officers who's a um, controller, but the officers are entering into what they think is another building, correct? Correct. Um, and this is them, you know, kind of what it would look like of us clearing the building without giving away all the tactics, but what their jobs are to ensure the safety. Yeah, what they're doing is, is just essentially making entry, determine if there's any victims, and then determine if there's any assailants inside that building. So they're, they're methodically clearing each, each room, um, staying together as a team, and again, without giving away any of our tactics, uh, just making sure that, that building is completely clear of any suspects or any other victims. Right, and so we have an actor here, obviously the, the young female that's in the video. Let's talk a little bit about when we're doing this. We're in, we're, the officers are in a high stress situation. Mm -hmm. And they are, they, I mean, they have to have muzzle discipline. That, that was not a suspect. We right. knew that, right? Mm -hmm. So adding that stress that they're going to encounter uh, somebody that's not, that they're, that's a victim. That's a witness. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to do on an average, everyday basis. Yeah. That's why this training is so important, because they get to feel that stress. They get to put their tactics to use. Um, and then we do have a controller that, that can critique them a little bit, but more importantly, they critique themselves and they know what they need to work on, what they did very well, and, and they can build on what they learned today. Yeah. And, and as, as we watch this video, I know some of the questions that uh, Mike and I took, uh, Ryan debriefed the, the police officer side of it, but some of the questions we took from some of our uh, role players that day from the teachers was, let's just say, we're, this is a, but, but if, if they didn't believe these were police officers coming to that door, it's okay to deny them entry. Absolutely. Um, until they can verify, and if we need to get into that room, we'll get a key to get into that room. But if you're ever unsure, we encourage you, if you, if you don't trust what it is, don't let anybody in. Absolutely. At, at that point, they're safe in that room, so they can stay there as long as they feel safe, and we'll get them out when we can. Yeah, and and we always look for those those keys and um, things in order to get there. But this one, they're doing a primary search um, on this. In this instance, we, we call this a ghost call, and um, in our terminology. And let's talk about that a little bit because as a, in a ghost call, in in. Critical incidents like this, there's always a, a victim may run that's injured to a third location, um, and then the 911 calls come in that, hey, maybe there's another shooter or another assailant in another building. Um, that taxes us, correct? I mean, absolutely. and so we, that was kind of one of the goals to this day, correct, was mm -hmm. how are we going to respond if there's multiple buildings where we get, where we get information? Um, obviously, with that, we, we clear everything along the way, right? Cars in the parking lot, exterior, mm -hmm. um, all, all the necessary um, to ensure everyone's safety. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was, again, one of the ghost calls that we had placed into the cable studio so we could get some videos. Let's talk about the timeline of that day. Let's walk through it. I mean, what, what time did you guys get here? Uh, Five-ish, yeah. five in the morning, yeah. It is, it's a long day, but... It started with the, uh, our safety checks. Everybody that entered the building had to be checked by our training cadre to make sure they weren't bringing any weapons in. And then we gave them bracelets to show that they had been checked. Um, so at a, at a quick glance, you can tell if somebody had been through the security check or not. Um, again, we're not willing to compromise any kind of safety for our training. Um, and then it went into a briefing for our first responders who met with Ryan uh, offsite and he gave a briefing about what they were going to encounter that day. And then we gave a briefing to all the school district staff as to what they were going to see and experience. And we gave a, a short PowerPoint about our response, trying to show them, hey, this is what you're going to see. This is you know, some of the things you may see, feel. Um, kind of prepping them to, to have a plan in their head and, and go over and have different options. Um, not necessarily the exact scenario they were going to see that day, but think about other possible scenarios so they would have a plan. So they did that PowerPoint, and then, and then we broke into the scenario. The scenario ran for approximately two hours, uh, a little short, because we actually accomplished all of our training goals in about an hour and 45 minutes, which, which made us really happy. The, yeah. the school had been checked, rechecked, checked again. I, I think we went through a total of four or five searches, all victims, 
had been treated, removed, the suspect had been neutralized, uh, we reached all our goals. So, Which is a credit to the training that we've been doing for years. Yeah, and correct. that partnership with our other agencies, and, and again, you guys weren't at some of the, the other podcasts, but I've talked to Oak Tech, um, and the importance of us working with our neighboring agencies as a county as a whole, because any one of these incidents, no matter how large, how it's going to overwhelm a community yeah. um, for days. In reality, it's for days. Yeah. Um, so, scenario started about 10 a.m. was live was when the scenario went live. Um, you know, we talk about training scars, and we don't. The last thing we want to do is leave training scars, and I, and that's a terminology in our line of work. But we. Mike, you talked about the briefing with um, the teachers, and we we hammered that home at the beginning. Is we don't want to create, yeah, we want to create the stress. But this isn't only something that they can use on the in uh, their jobs, right? This this type of training exposure can be used anywhere, whether they're at the movie theater with their family, whether they're at mm -hmm. a, the mall, and we're, we're seeing it happen all over the place. Um, so, what's the most helpful thing? that we think as a community that members of our community can do um, to help in these situations? Have a plan. Like that we, we really reiterated that to everyone there that day, was to have a plan. Know your exits. Um, you just can't assume somebody else is going to take care of you. Um, and, and as our citizens, you know, they're shopping at Costco, they should be paying attention. You know, we, we preach situational awareness. We want them, if they see something that doesn't look right, it's probably not right. It could be something extremely minor, or it could be something that needs a little bit more attention. But, um, you know, we preach to them, hey, if, if it doesn't look right, call the police. We'll come and check it out. If it's, We'd love to come out and find out that it's absolutely nothing. But if it is something, then we'll deal with it appropriately yeah. too. But um, we, want, we want people to leave with a heightened sense of situational awareness and we want them to leave that training knowing that if something were to happen they can survive it they're prepared um and you talked about training sirs. we didn't want them leaving feel defeated we didn't want them leaving feeling scared feeling that this is something that they'll never be able to do we want them to leave with the confidence knowing that if this were to happen i'm going to have a plan i'm going to be able to react and i'm going to be able to save myself and save others You're right and um we did have, and I want to make sure we know this wasn't a forced event for the teachers. We asked for volunteers for those that wanted to participate, be, in, be either pretend to be students or some of them put in positions what they would be in if they were in the high school, because that's where we used um, on a day if, if this tragedy were to happen. Um, and there was opt outs to opt outs. So if people didn't want to participate at all, um, they could be excused to a different room. But a lot of them stayed in the, into the auditorium and watched via the uh, camera system, how the response would look. So, and overall, I think we really accomplished what we wanted to accomplish that day. And I think one thing that we need to talk about real is if this was a true event anywhere, whether it's school, whether it's in the community, um, what can the community expect? Can we give any, as we did this day, we were able to control portions of this, right? We controlled, you know, what time the, the scenario started. We controlled how long the scenario should go. Um, we controlled what the teachers actually did in the building um, only because we didn't want them jumping out windows and, and getting hurt, right? In reality, we know those types of things would happen. But we can't predict a timeline to give the community on any one of these events, correct? Correct. They're so unpredictable. Yeah. Um, and so what our community can expect from this is that we do these trainings, we practice with our partners all the time, so that they know we're prepared as an agency to respond to anything, whether it's indoors, outdoors, and that we're not going to hesitate. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about the exposure, and, and both of you have tend, uh, and we've talked about it in the past again, but the Active Assailant Conference. And one of the debriefs we got this year was from a, a tragedy down in Texas where the teachers had not been exposed um, to these types of incidents and kind of did an impromptu of what they thought was right. And, I, and I'm not going to second guess them because I can't, I wasn't in that room. Um, but we know the lack of exposure caused tragedy, caused casualties. Um, and we use that information. We, we learn from yeah, everyone. That's, how, these, that's and, how we get better too. Right. So, so that's, that's very important. Well, part of this was we wanted to build confidence with the school district in the police department and show that if something were 
to happen like this, that we are prepared. The police department, fire department, local communities, you know, we wanted to show them that we train very hard um, to be prepared. And it goes beyond our township. It goes throughout the county. That's why we brought in the other agencies to, to so that we could train together, so that we know that if agencies from our surrounding departments are coming to help us, that we're all doing the same thing. We all know what each other's doing, and we're all prepared. And then vice versa, if we have to go to another community, um, they know when we're coming in that we all are going to be doing the exact same thing. Um, and there's no more no one more critical on ourselves than ourselves. Right. And in and, and this event, you know, when we even say it, we had evaluators from outside agencies come in. Um, and evaluate each section mm -hmm. along the way. And you guys, will be, you, I, I know today, even you guys have a debrief with the school, yes. um, and uh, you'll be writing up an after action report on you know what our strengths, our weaknesses, and what our opportunities to learn are, yeah. which are which is where we gain the most insight. And you know, Ryan, I know you personally, and, and you responded to Oxford. Um, and you also responded recently to the Great Lakes Crossing when there was a threat of it. So yeah. in, in, in a six-month period of time, we'll say, I guess, or a year period of time, yeah. um, you responded to two incidents that one was involved, uh, you know, casualties and one didn't, but the threat was there and the report was there. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it shows that we this is necessary. Unfortunately, I mean, unfo yeah. yeah and, but, and I will say with that, I mean, I, I felt very comfortable with the people I was with knowing the department members that I was with because of how we have trained and how we have um, hammered home this year after year after year, training, 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 so that when it is the real thing, your stress level can actually come down a little bit. You aren't, you aren't as stressed as you would think you would be because, again, you've been through it. Whether it be a training scenario or not, you've been through something that has been a very high stress situation, and it allows you to, to kind of control your, your emotions and your stress um, when it actually is happening. So you, you said something there that just kind of triggered something with that. And I guess part of that is when you see these responses now and we've been to some of these situations, it's, you're, we're kind of in awe of ourselves, or, not of ourselves, when we see the other agencies responding that are coming from all over the place. Yeah. And the urgency to get in, yeah. right? We've seen it across national news where some agencies in the past or some of these situations as as they evolve, we learn from them where there was may have been a delay because the, the old school tactics were, were, you kind of went back to those old school tactics, but we, hand, we, we now drill into our minds that that's not how it works. Right. Um, and even watching this scenario as an observer of that day, you know, watching the, the, the contact teams were already in the building, so I didn't see them, but I saw the fire department, you know, waiting and all their guys stacked up waiting and like almost impatiently yeah. um, to get into that building. And let's talk about that a little bit. We do see some of these things where it's like, oh, look at there's 50 cops standing outside or 50 firemen standing outside. Why aren't they going in? But one of the safety things is we can't have crossfire in these buildings. So we got to ensure that that doesn't happen even on our response, the last thing we want is what we call blue on blue uh, shootings inside that building that just add to the stress. So some of that's that communication of trying to figure out where those other teams are in the building and what areas need attention. Yeah, we, we can't just throw 100 officers into a building and just say go, you know, because then you don't know you don't you don't know that you're methodically searching the exact areas. You don't know that um, you know you're not double and triple checking something and leaving other areas completely unchecked. Um, but also with, uh, you know, the new rescue task force, what we have, where we're going in with, with paramedics who are there to simply triage patients, um, we need to make sure that they're in what we would call a warm zone, meaning that we know that there's no active threat in that area where they can do their job and they can triage their victims as opposed to going in and having to look over their shoulder and think that there might be something, you know, coming around the corner or something like that. So it's... It, it may look like at times that there's maybe a, a backup of resources that aren't being utilized, um, but there is a plan. There's always a plan, and you know you just got to kind of let that plan play out. Yeah, and there's plans for everything, right? You get a reunification center, we or, or a gathering place is what what we should be calling it. Um, we have to have security there. Yeah, we have to have ambulances there. We have, so that initial push into a, to an, an active scene it really expands out over time. But as we wrap up, let's just talk real, uh, real quick about um, how does Bloomfield Township set the expectations for safety in our community? Um, we talk, and we, if we've answered it along the way, um, the training, we hammer down on the training, we hire the right people. Um, 
But we don't just stop there. I know Ryan is, again, working on the shifts. You get an opportunity um, to train, and, and not necessarily as a former FTO, but you're more than willing to bring a new officer who's brand new out of the academy or new to our agency, and you take them and run scenarios on a shift level yeah. so that they get comfortable with the, what the expectations we set for ourselves here in Bloomfield Township. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and I've talked about this before, but our training sets us apart from other communities. And I don't even want to say so many other communities around us because you guys have developed such a great relationship with agencies around us. I say that our county um, as a whole sets us apart from pretty much anywhere else in the country. Yeah. Um, and in how we train the tactics the same way. And I've already talked about it on po past podcasts, but it needs to be our communities, all of our communities that we know. Bloomfield Township's coming to Birmingham if it happens. They're com we're coming to Troy, <laughs> and there's no hesitation, right? Oak Tech's very <clears throat> unique, and it developed a, a systematic response for all local agencies, and we built that partnership with them. We've also built a partnership with the school district, our fire departments, our local um, fire departments besides our own. So that's what kind of sets us apart. We are we have a, built that partnership over many years of training, and we take it very serious. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, give me one thing that you thought was successful that day or that you were impressed of with that day. Honestly, the entire response. The fact that we were able to end the scenario early because our guys knew exactly what to do and how to do it, and, and they did it extremely well. Good. All right. Anything to add? I, I would just say the, the leadership with some of the um, teams that we had going through. I, I talked about it in my debrief with the with the first responders, and it was uh, they didn't need to be told what to do necessarily at all times. If there was some work to be done, they found work and they did it, and that was that was impressive. In these incidents, um, what is the best thing the community can do uh, to help us out when we're on those scenes? Well, if they find themselves actually involved in the incident, first and foremost, if you can get out of that situation, that, that's your best course of action. Um, you know, we preach leaving the scene if, if they're able to do so. Um, but they need to be prepared and have a plan. Like I say, if you're at Costco and something like this happens, you need to understand where the exits are, what's going on, what's going to be able to keep you safe and possibly others around you safe. Um, if you are nearby and you hear about one of these incidents breaking off, we don't want you to respond there. We want you to go away from there, as a matter of fact, because it's going to be an extremely chaotic scene. You're going to have law enforcement and fire departments coming from all over, and the last thing we need is more congestion from other citizens coming to find out what's going on or find out, you know, who's involved. Maybe they had a family member that works there, things of that nature. Um, they need to know that we have plans in place and that we will have places set up for people to go where we can provide them with information and, and reunite them with people who were at the scene and things of that nature, but we want to make sure yeah. that they don't respond to the scene themselves. Yeah. And Ryan, let's talk directly about schools, yeah. because it goes against every instinct that we have as a parent not to get to our kids. But we have plans in place, communications in place to get parents you know, back, hopefully reunited with their family or the information that they need as soon as possible. Yeah. So it goes against what we want, but yes. the best thing to do is... Yeah, do not, definitely not show up. Um, that, that taxes our resources as well. So it may, if, if we have 500 parents showing up at a scene, uh, that could be pulling officers away from things that they may need to be doing to, to be able to manage that. So yeah, there's always gonna be a plan in place as to where, uh, like we said, a reunification site or a, a gathering place. Uh, and that communication will come from the school district as to where that place is going to be and where parents uh, should go to be reunited with their student or child. Right, and we have, as things have progressed in our communities, you know, the police department has a community relations officer and a public information officer who works directly with our overall uh, cable studio director or communications director for the actual township and the school district. So that information is going to be pushed out right. in tandem, the same message, where to go and how to get there. But that can deter our response um, from one, from all the other agencies, but the ambulance is especially coming if there are victims to getting them to the closest hospital as quickly as we can. Again, I want to thank you guys uh, coming for, for coming in today. This is a very important topic for our community to understand that we prepare uh, the best we can. We, we're more than willing to learn from our mistakes, uh, but we can't learn from those mistakes if we don't have the partnerships with our community, obviously our school district that allowed this event to take place. Uh, we thank the teachers because we know this was totally outside of their normal uh, 
professional developed learning, but we've taken what they've told us in the past and really put it to use. So again, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank you for what you do in, in this event. And from a, from a chief's perspective, from and, and speaking on behalf of the township, went great. So I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, we'll see you on the next podcast.